if you look at if you look at public statements, like you can you can find Sam Altman specifically saying there's a good chance that this kills everyone, right? I I, I mean I don't that's not like a direct quote, um, but I think he said you know the the bad outcome is lights out for everyone or something like that. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast, where we bring you the brightest minds and the latest insights into the field of artificial intelligence. Now, today, we're absolutely thrilled to have with us an extraordinary individual who's been pushing the boundaries of our understanding of AI and its potential impacts on our lives, Robert Miles. Now, Robert is a renowned artificial intelligence advocate, researcher and YouTube sensation whose unique mix of engaging discussions and entertaining content has captured the interest of thousands or even millions of viewers around the world. Do we have a backup plan? Well, this turns out to be a really hard problem. How do you design a training process that reliably differentiates between things that are true and things that you think are true when you yourself can't differentiate between those two things, kind of by definition? This is an active area of study in AI alignment research, and I'll talk about some approaches to framing and tackling this problem in later videos. Now, with a strong background in computer science, Robert has been actively involved in various AI safety projects and has dedicated himself to raising awareness about the potential risks and benefits of advanced AI systems. His YouTube channel is widely recognized for making AI safety discussion accessible to a diverse audience by breaking down complex topics into easy to understand nuggets of knowledge. Now, many of you will know Robert from his appearances on Computerfile. I've been a huge fan of Robert for many, many years now, and I'm so excited that we've got him on MLST. Now, in today's episode, we're going to be diving deep into Robert's journey into the world of AI, exploring his insights on alignment, superintelligence, the role of AI in shaping our society, and indeed the future. This podcast is sponsored by Numeri, a groundbreaking platform that's taking the data science world by storm. I've been using Numeri to build state-of-the-art models which predict the stock market, all while being part of an inspiring community of data scientists from around the globe. They host the Numeri Data Science Tournament where data scientists like us use their obfuscated financial data set to predict future stock market performance. Now, the unique aspect about the tournament is that it runs weekly rounds, with each round spanning a month. Every week, starting from Saturday to Friday, there are four stages open, closed, scoring and resolved and throughout we get to work with Numeri's clean pre-processed data which describes the global stock market over time. Now this data set is tabular with each row representing stock at a particular point in time and our primary objective is to build machine learning models to predict the target variable which represents a measure of future returns. Now, the best part is we get scored on our predictions based on parameters like correlation and true contribution. And not only that, we can stake NMR, which is Numeri's very own cryptocurrency on our models, which allows us to earn payouts based on our performance. A positive score means we earn a payout, while a negative score could lead to a portion of our stake getting burned. Now, Numeri even has a leaderboard which ranks us based on our model's one-year average reputation score. So, not only do we get a chance to earn rewards, but we also have an opportunity to measure our skills against the very best data scientists in the world. Competing in Numeri's tournament has been an amazing way for me to sharpen my data science skills. I couldn't recommend it enough to my fellow data scientists and enthusiasts. If this intrigues you, Head over to Numeri and join in this exciting journey in revolutionizing the financial world through the power of data science. Now, let's get back to today's podcast. I bring you Robert Miles. Robert is one of the main faces, I think, associated with the alignment uh, movement and definitely one of, one of the most credible voices as well because I think he's just so good at, at communication and kind of making these concepts understandable. Uh, to people. But um, Robert, maybe you could just kick off and just give us a clear definition of alignment, one which can be consistently applied across different AI systems and contexts. Yeah. So first off, I want to say I have been oversold here 
Um, I think I'm reasonably, <laughs> I'm reasonably good at explaining things if I have days to sit down and write a script and then read that script. Uh, let's see how we do ad lib. Um, so, so the way I think about alignment is uh, basically if you have AI systems that want something, uh, it's aligned if what it wants is the same thing as what you want. It's, uh, you know, like that's the simplest, the simplest way I could frame it. Um, and so it's important to note that it's not, it's not that it wants the same, it's not that it wants the same thing that you want uh, for itself. It's that its preference ordering over world states is the same as yours. So it will choose outcomes that are what you would want to happen. Okay. Okay. So in, in which case, I'm interested to know what a good solution to AI alignment would look like, but, you know, a super intelligence which actually understands and agrees with our deeply held human values and morality. Um, would that then mean it would just cure cancer and solve global warming without us needing to prompt it to do so? In principle, yeah. I mean, that's, um, that's a style of system that's called a sovereign agent where you just sort of turn it on and it does things. And if it's aligned, the things it does are good. Um, that's not the only type of design that you might think of. Um, it's the kind where alignment is most important because the thing is out there just doing things. Um, you could try to make a system which just answers your questions, for example, that has a super intelligent like, understanding of the world and you ask it for particular outputs and it provides them to you uh, and it's not sort of independently going off and doing things in the world, um, which maybe is a bit safer, is also less powerful, right? It's less, act it's less effective. You can't do as much with one of those. Well, it seems like, okay. <clears throat> it seems like there's a real spectrum here because, and you know, full disclosure, I'm a big fan of any science fiction that involves um, uh, you know, super intelligent AIs. So, I mean, think um, culture, the culture series by Ian Banks or, um, you know, th those sorts of things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and in those, to me, I, I want to take a little bit different view on alignment and just see how compatible this is, which is, I would say a super intelligent AI system is, al is aligned as long as it's not actively seeking to annihilate humanity. It may not necessarily be totally interested in solving all of our problems. It may have its own, you know, areas of interest. And since I think we're always going to be dealing with finite resources, it might be off, you know, pursuing its own hobbies or research directions or, you know, exploring the galaxy. But as long as it's not actively seeking to obliterate humanity, I would say that, that it's aligned. Is that, I mean, that seems to lie on a spectrum. Is that fair or not? Yeah, I think that there's maybe less middle ground here than than people think um, in the sense that like we are not, as you say, there's finite resources. We are not aligned with ants. We're not going out of our way to destroy ants. But when we build a house or something, if there's an ant nest there, it's destroyed uh, and we don't think twice about it. And so something which doesn't have it in for us, is not explicitly trying to destroy us, is uh, reasonably likely to destroy us anyway, just on the way to do something else. So um, I agree with you that operationally, I would cons like, I'll take it, I'll consider it a solution at this point, if we can just be confident that it does not in practice kill everyone. Um, but I think that the only way to sort of be confident that we're actually getting that is quite good alignment, actually. I think that like uh, a, a near miss on alignment is probably still very bad. Um, I don't think we have that much leeway. Yeah, so let me probe that a little bit because, um, I mean, the, the resource argument is, is a fairly common one, right? Like if I'm going to make paper clips, you know, well, I'm just going to strip mine the earth to make paper clips. But the thing is, it's actually much easier to strip mine the asteroid belt. Like the universe is a, is a very, very large place. And if you were just wanting to make paper clips, like the earth is probably not the most effective place for you to focus your, your limited energy, right? So 
why is it always assumed that if AIs were going to go and build things and needed matter and energy, why would they hang out here on the earth? Why wouldn't they go elsewhere? There's a lot better sources of, of energy and, and raw material. I think, I think just uh, as, a, as a question of fact, I don't think that's actually true. Um, because all of the matter and energy on earth is like right here, right now, and you don't have to do anything to get it. Um, but also, if it's not the best source of these materials, it's still a source, right? And so, yeah, you definitely mine the asteroid belt, but like you take apart Earth in order to build the things that go out and mine the asteroid belt, right? There's, you're not going to just, if there are resources available, you're not going to just leave them. Like, there's no, there's, it doesn't feel as though this um, gets us any actual safety. But that seems to, that seems to assume, you know, the infinite ability to exploit resources, right? And, and maybe this will get into another question I have later about this assumption of kind of, you know, infinite power, infinite anything you want, the best at everything possible that you can assign to AI. But just focusing back on the resource issue, asteroids are a much more pure source of iron ore, for example, mm -hmm. than anything that you're going to have access to on the surface of the earth because it long ago melted and sank to the core, right? Sure. So I think it's just factually true that, and we're even trying to plan this ourselves as human beings, like let's do the minimum we need to to get up into space sustainably. From that point on, we can try and mine, you know, the resources that are out there because they're just much more convenient and there's so much more space out there. You know, yeah, we have these issues to deal with humans surviving in space, but presumably an AI, you know, wouldn't suffer from those same limitations. Yeah, I mean, I think if it were the case that it were easier to get stuff from asteroids than on Earth, then we would have done it already. Um, but even then, it's not as though there aren't resources on Earth, right? And if it helps you, if it gets you to your asteroid 1% quicker to destroy Earth in the process, then that's better. But I, I want to talk about this infinitude thing because that feels important. Um, I don't think that a superintelligence would have infinite anything. I don't actually think that infinite things are real. Like, nothing infinite can exist in the universe. Um, all that's required is, like, dramatically superior to humans or to humanity as a whole. And I think people really overestimate humanity. I think that in the grand scheme of things, like people say, well, you have to hit some kind of threshold, right? That um, you've got this exponential curve. It has to, it can't go up forever. It has to level off. Absolutely true. It does have to level off. But that kind of implies something that it has to level off somewhere near where humans are, that humans are like anywhere near that we're within three to 12, like orders of magnitude of where the upper limit is that physics imposes. Um, and I don't see good reasons to believe that on most things. Um, we might be close to the frontier on like energy efficiency, but we're probably in a local maximum for that as well. Um, so there's a, you know, for example, um, you know, stockfish, the most recent stockfish, it's not infinitely good at chess, but it may as well be, right? Like, compared to any human, it may as well be. The chance of a human beating it is zero. Um, and so, yeah. uh, you know, you don't actually need infinity in order to get, um, in order to be better than humans. There's one, there's one intuition that I would give here, which is like, if you look at the rate at which evolution is able to build up capabilities, you look at the first sort of anatomically modern humans, uh, was a long time ago, but in evolutionary terms, it was zero time ago, right? Evolution has not really had time to touch us meaningfully since the beginning of, like, culture, let's say, during which point we went from animals to footprints on the moon. So what that effectively means is, if something dumber than us could have done that, it would have, Right? Like, the, the rate at which cultural accumulation happens relative to the rate at which evolution happens means that we are approximately the least intelligent thing that's capable of building a technological civilization. 
Um, yeah. And so there, there shouldn't be any expectation that we're anywhere near the optimum, that, um, that you need to be infinite to be massively better than us. I think we're just not that smart. We're just not that good. And once something actually uh, hits a point where it's moving at a faster rate in a similar way to the way that culture moves at a faster rate than evolution, um, I expect the thing to, in human terms, start bumping up against the physical limits in fairly short order. Um, and I don't expect the physical limits to be anywhere near where we are now. I think that there's two very important things to touch on there. And the thing that you've just spoken about is this notion of uh, rapid transient changes in capabilities. And I think we'll come back to that in a little mm -hmm. while because it's a very, very interesting topic. But on the infinity thing, we've discussed this a lot on the show. We've spoken to digital physics folks like Wolfram and Joshua Bark, uh, even Pedro Domingos, who believes that there's there are no practical infinities in the universe. And lots of people in AI um, think that even if in a platonic abstract way, just being able to represent infinity in a cognitive architecture is very important. Chomsky speaks about it even, you know, language is, has infinite cardinality, but language models have proven that they can be represented probabilistically. And even though technically it's infinite, um, just a shallow representation is more than enough to capture most of colloquial language use and, and maybe even a lot of capabilities. Uh, in fact, Keith, I think you probably got some very interesting um, uh, points on this. Yeah, but I mean, even bring it closer to home what i'm what i'm talking about so if if the if the setup here is we're, we're saying you know there are arguments for um ai risk and and then some who don't believe it or, or that sort of thing i think what i'm saying is for example no you can't put any you can't put any hyper intelligent chip in my brain no matter what it doesn't exist and it never will that will enable me to shoot laser beams out of my eye Okay, no such chip will ever allow me in this form to flap my hands in such a way that I fly. And yet I get like the impression that, and I'm not saying this is you, I'm just saying that, I mean, in, in any side of debate, there are like extremists, right? And I get the impression that there are, you know, more than a few people on the doomerism side of the equation who in the back of their mind, like they, they go, yeah, but I think that might be possible. You know, I think there is a smart enough way that I could shoot laser beams out of my eye. And, you know, when they're practicing Tai Chi, they think if they just do it just right, Emperor Palpatine lightning will shoot out like the end of their hand. And, and like, I don't know, am, am I insane or are there actually people on that side of the debate that don't recognize that, in fact, however intelligent something is, there are, there's physics, right? There's physics that limit all of us. Yeah, no, I think there's some kind of implicit assumption that like, and I'm now going to straw man you horribly, just a heads up. Sure, no um, worries. That you're like, man, I'm really good at, what was it, Tai Chi? Is that, a, is, that a, is that a combat martial art? Whatever, I'm really good at this martial art. Yep. And you're saying you can beat me. And to do that, you'd have to shoot lasers out of your eyes because that's how good I am, right? And I don't believe that you can do that however smart you are. I'm saying you don't have to shoot lasers out of your eyes. You just got to be smart. We're not that smart. Well, like, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm looking more at, um, you know, the phenomenon of life has, has become sort of increasingly interesting to me over time. Like, let's say over the last, I don't know, 10 to 15 years, because the more you study it, the more you realize it's nanotechnology. I mean, it's yeah. literally just all these little nano machines. And you said, like, it's maybe close to the optimum of energy efficiency, but there's other things it does too, which is it's self-replicating. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't need an electrical grid to power it. It just needs to, you know, in the case of plants, get sunlight It needs to traverse the terrain and consume, you know, other life forms or whatever. So life, like the, the huge number of life forms that exist on the earth, were part of this evolutionary optimization algorithm. And they produced, you know, this huge variety of, really technological structures and nanotechnology and different levels of intelligence and all this type of thing. So we may not be at the maximum of intelligence, um, but we may be at the limits of what any intelligence can achieve with some you know, constraints of existence like on the earth. So I don't think it's just a given that if I have an artificial hyperintelligence that within five days, it's going to defeat all the world's armies 
all the king's men consume the surface of the earth and launch into space. Yeah, I don't think that's a given. Um, I don't think we can rule it out, uh, but I don't think it's like... Yeah, I think some people are overconfident about how quickly we lose or how completely we lose. But uh, I'm confident that we lose. I, I don't think that we... You know what I mean? I don't think that we actually like eke out a win against something drastically smarter than us. Well, I think there has to be a time point at which, there, you know, there is a Rubicon, right? But I mean, you wouldn't be advocating for any AI risk technology or thought whatsoever if you thought we'd already lost, right? That's so there, true. there's a yeah. time, you know, and, and maybe, maybe Herbert was right in Dune where there'll be a Butlerian revolt, you know, at some point we're all like, just like, all right, F this, it's gone too far and we've managed to destroy, you know, every machine, you know, consciousness yes. right can, can i summarize a few things i mean like we, we said that you don't need infinities i agree and then when you think of a pure intelligence let's say in a computer game okay. look at the elo system in chess it basically tells you that there are roughly 30 skill levels where in the level above the person will be at the person the level below 95 percent of the time it's got a huge ceiling right but I think Keith and I, our skepticism is that that doesn't necessarily translate into the physical world. Okay. I intuit that in the physical world, there'll be lots of friction. But my skepticism of superintelligence is often on the basis of, well, we're not going to have this intellectual Santa Claus machine where it's going to materialize into the physical world and take over everything. But actually, it needs humans. But humans might counterintuitively be the driving force behind the proliferation of, of superintelligence. Yeah. So one thing I'll say is I think that if you have 30 levels of it in chess, um, chess is an extremely, extremely simple game, right? So you expect the skill ceiling there to be quite low, relatively speaking. Adding complexity just rewards intelligence more, right? The more complex the game, the more important it is to be smart and the more like levels of smart are available. So like, I think that I, I would expect the real world to have this property of like a very wide range of skill levels to a much, much greater degree than chess does. Well, it also increases the requirement for, for uh, neurons, right? Like, uh, I mean, if it, if it takes, how many parameters are in GPT-4, Tim? Like, you know, you know this, I don't. I don't no think no one knows, this. but we suspect it might be roughly a trillion. Okay, so it takes, it takes a trillion parameters, you know, currently just to halfway understand natural language. How many parameters is it going to take to operate as an autonomous, you know, entity in the physical world? Yeah, like a bunch. I think it's less than a trillion probably, by the way, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't have yeah, any you, secret you know information. More than me. No, no. Yeah, neither do I. Neither do I, I. mean, they're, they're I mean, play, they yeah. are correctly playing that close to their chest. Sure. Um, but yeah, so, it's yeah, going to need a yeah. bunch. I don't know. It doesn't feel... Um, uh, what conclusion are we arguing for here? Well, that what I'm arguing is that, um, you know, we are so many steps away from an android that can function in this real world and, you know, fight and win against human beings. You know, we're very, very, very far away from that because you need massive amounts of machinery and electricity and energy and circuitry and all this kind of stuff just to do the simple problems. Uh, yeah, I don't think... Like, we're obviously a long way away in some sense, uh, but we're also moving fairly fast and moving faster all the time. Um, I'm not really strongly tied to specific timelines it's not something that I've spent a huge amount of my time thinking about. Um, but if you look at if you look at what GPT-4 can do and what it costs to run, um, I don't know how much better how much better do you need to do? And what happens when we discover things that work better than transformers? What happens when we bring online the chips that are custom built for running these things uh, optimal efficiency and all of the like future research that we get and how fast does that research progress when you can have 
research assistants that, you know, never sleep and have read every paper ever written. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, I, you know, think... to say that that's like many, many decades seems like an obvious mistake to me. I don't think if we, if we continue at the pace that we're going, we get there within a few decades. And if we accelerate, which probably is what's going to happen, then we get there sooner, is my guess. Okay, I mean, we'll we'll talk about um, Hinton's comments later, but he made a similar comment that what's new now is that this chatbot has all of the world's collective knowledge, but there's so much more to intelligence than just knowing. So GPT-4, it's a it's a type of intelligence. It has a facet of intelligence, you know, most defined by the fact that it seems to know everything, but there seems to be more to it than that. And this also brings us to the, I don't know if you saw the article from the Google engineer about they don't have a moat anymore, which is mm. that now... The um, the Lambda model got released from Facebook that, you know, let's say 7 billion uh, going up to 65 billion parameters. And the rate of innovation in the open source community has been dramatic. There's now these um, uh, new ways of fine tuning the models and the capabilities came up to, G to GPT, um, you know, chat GPT 3.5 within about three weeks. But there's been some pushback against that because you could argue that, yeah, now everyone's got access to this technology and some of those people will use it to do bad things. But the counter argument is it still costs about, I don't know, $50 million to train one of these models. The open source models are about a year old and the large companies aren't going to release the models anymore. So do you actually think there's going to be this explosion of innovation and progress or, or do you think that the big players will still remain in control? That's a really, really hard question to answer because uh, that depends on a bunch of politics, I guess, or like how humans behave. Um, so I don't know, but I think in the world in which the main progress is just happening in the major labs, you still see accelerated, accelerating progress, right? It's not like, it's not like stagnation is, is a, like a very plausible outcome from, from either of those scenarios. Yeah, and speaking of that, um, I remember you mentioned once that it's not unreasonable to believe that the research community, you know, could agree um, not to pursue unsafe AI research or, you know, commit to, commit to AI safety. But we have this other trend of, of this increasing, let's say, miniaturization and, and lowering the bar to entry and democratization of, of AI. So unlike previous cases that you mentioned, like in that video, say cloning, for example, human cloning, you know, uh, let's take another example, nuclear, you know, proliferation treaties, um, uh, you know, autonomous weapon systems, et cetera, the barrier to entry is so much lower. And at some point, it, it's probably going to be like really, really low so that so that where a guy in a basement, you know, with a couple computers and sufficient knowledge could, could produce a really hazardous um, AI and unleash it onto the world, kind of like a, a virus, you know, on, on uh, super intelligence, right? So mm -hmm. is it really realistic to still, to still advocate for things like pausing research like Elon Musk and, and signers did or you know, passing international, you know, treaties. To, I mean, is that really practical or should we try to look for other solutions to AI uh, safety? Yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. I'm not seeing anything else. There are things that are more realistic to achieve, but that wouldn't help, right? Or that wouldn't work. Uh, and there are things that might actually solve the problem, but are pretty unrealistic. That seems like the the set of options available to us now. Can you can you go into some more detail on that? So what are what are a couple that are realistic but won't help and and likewise some that are maybe less palatable but would work? Yeah, I mean, so for example, this like six month pause. It that's like reasonably unrealistic, right? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a big ask. And I think the reason that they asked for six months is because they didn't expect to be able to get better than that. And they were going for something that they thought they had a chance of, you know, actually making progress on. But it's not as though, like, alignment research is not six months behind capabilities research. I don't know how long it is. Right. Could be decades, right? right. Um, so it's not as though there's some plan in place 
that if we had an extra six months to do this plan, then the problem would be solved, right? Right. Um, and therefore, this is like, it, 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 it kind of, it's kind of rough because it's like, it's asking enough that it's unrealistic that it would actually happen, but it's not asking enough that it's realistic that it could solve the problem. It's this kind of compromise. Um, maybe what we should be asking for is just an enormous amount of money to do alignment research with. Uh, just something to really massively accelerate the rate of progress in alignment research. Um, that is the kind of thing which it's maybe more feasible to get. Governments can move money around um, a bit more yeah. easily than they can like make new legislation or whatever. Um, I think what we probably need is a combination of a bunch of different things. I think we probably want to throw the kitchen sink at this. I mean, on, on that, though, I mean, first of all, presumably you signed that letter. I actually haven't, but... Uh, okay, but you, you would have done in, in, in principle. Have, yeah, I don't think anybody cares what I think, but if they did, I think I probably would have signed it, yeah. They, def they definitely do. But um, I, I guess this gets to the notion, though, that what we're in the midst of now is an arms race, right? Everyone is competing to build the best AI model and... It's remarkably open, actually. People are just publishing the models on the internet. And you can clearly imagine a world now where this is taking priority over safety and alignment research. It's basically being deprioritized in this arms race. That, that, that's the concern, right? But how would you address that? Yeah, I think that like we could be, things could be a lot worse in this respect. Like the people who have the biggest chance of actually creating AGI being deep mind and open AI, uh, and possibly Anthropic now. Um, all three of those organizations were, in principle, founded with a very strong safety focus, right? Like, they're, um, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but there's kind of a philosophy of like, this is going to happen at some point, and there doesn't seem to be a broadly understood um, sense of how dangerous this is. And so we should be the ones to do it because we understand how dangerous it is. Um, and so, like, the extent to which they're racing is a lot less than it could be. Um, if you look at, so for example, OpenAI kept GPT-4 for something like six months internally, doing tests and evaluations on it uh, to, to, to learn things about its behavior and its properties before they released it to the world. Um, that's better than just immediately releasing it, right? It's not great. Just, like that. It's just a tiny bit, though, because they they had the, I mean, they, they were the leaders, uh, indisputably so, and they had the time to do that. Google now, I think there have been people saying internally that they've kind of lost their way a little bit. They had a huge focus on on ethics and and safety and doing things the right way. And now they've released Bard almost without any testing and everyone's running at 100 miles an hour. Um, OpenAI has said that they're just, they're just going to incrementally release versions of GPT-4 on the top. And cynically, I think that's because if they made another big release, there'd be another moratorium. So it kind of feels that now with all of these other folks like Stability and, and uh, Anthropic releasing models, all of that's gone out the window. Tim, it sounds like you're saying Open OpenAI chose to slowly boil the frog, so we don't we don't notice. I think they're doing that now. Now they've started slowly boiling the frog. Yeah, I don't know. It's very hard to understand the psychology. Um, but if you look at if you look at public statements, like you can you can find Sam Altman specifically saying there's a good chance that this kills everyone. Right. I, I mean, I don't that's not like a direct quote, um, but I think he said, you know, the, the bad outcome is lights out for everyone or something like that. Do please fact check that. Um, but like he said that he knows that. Um, OK, the people running Microsoft. Don't, as far as I can tell, have any grasp of the problem whatsoever. Uh, and that's a problem because they are. As I understand it, the goal of the CEO, CEO was to deliberately antagonize Google. Um, 
and provoke them into a kind of a race, a competition, um, which is just very, very, very stupid. Uh, so there are there are people who are pushing forward as fast as possible, but there are also people who I think would like to slow down if they felt like they could get away with it. Okay, I, I think the thing the thing that um, doesn't quite do it for me is is like so you say things like we're all going to die, and I'm not quite Probably. in that in that headspace yet. I'm thinking of Jeffrey Hinton five years ago saying all radiologists will lose their jobs. None of them did. And he's come out again saying quite similar things a few days ago. And I still, maybe I'm being eternally optimistic. Um, I don't think it will significantly deplay. I mean, obviously, it's going to dramatically change the, the job market. But it still feels to me like humans are an integral part. And there's this problem with friction with humans and, and the real world. So the thing I'm missing is the intuition on that jump, that radical jump. Right. Well, so it needn't be a jump. Uh, I think a jump is like pretty plausible, but I don't think that in the absence of a jump we're safe. Um, so I can tell you a story. Well, this always happens. So okay, For, before I start the story, there's a thing that often happens where I'm trying to. I'm like I'm like navigating the the game tree here. Um, and maybe I'll have to deal with things as they arise. But um, there's a conversation that I often have where somebody says, I think I'm going to beat Magnus Carlsen because I have found this really good opening that's great. And I've beaten all of my amateur chess player friends with it. It's undefeatable. We're, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to go play Magnus Carlsen and I'm going to bet my house on it. And I'm saying, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you're going to lose this. And then people say, I don't see, like I've thought through all of the plays against this opening. I'm pretty sure I've got it, right? I can't think of any way that I get beaten here, right? Tell me how Magnus Carlsen's going to beat me. And I have to say, well, I don't, I'm not as good at chess as he is. Like, I, if I could tell you what moves he would play that would beat you, I'd be as good at chess as he is. Fine. I'm just telling you, he's better at chess than you. He's going to win. And they say, well, okay, but that's like very abstract. And I'm, I'm not, I don't buy it. It's like, all right, fine. Suppose he does this, right? And I present some idea on the board. And you go, no, I can get around that by doing this. Like, all right, fine. If you can get around that by doing that, then he wouldn't have done that. He would have done something that you can't get around, right? Um, and it just puts me in this impossible position of trying to lay out the game that a super intelligence would play against you when I'm not smarter than you to actually be able to play that game. You just point at the thing and say, look, it's better at the, the, the actual game that's being played, which is like selecting actions in the world that result in the world being in some specific configuration, despite the actions of other agents in the world that want it to be some other way. So the world ends up how that system wants the world to be, even if you try to stop it. Um, with that said, I can show you some ideas on the board if you like. Well, so since chess has come up a couple of times, let's dig into it a little bit deeper, um, which is, um, it's always been the case and it still is the case, despite rumors to the contrary, that, uh, cybernetic systems, which is to say a human being plus a machine beat pure machines. So like in correspondence chess, for example, the, the, the teams, if you will, that win are a human being who's really good at playing, you know, interoperating with computers using both Stockfish and LC0 or whatever the current, you know, open source version of, um, you know, Alpha Zero was. Um, so humans and machines have different kinds of intelligence and the, the uh, let's say, the hybrid combination of both outperforms like just artificial intelligence. I don't know if you're aware of that. I was that under fact, the impression but what, that, that what would you make true. of that? That's interesting. Yeah, well, this is an empirical as of a year disagreement ago, it was still, it's still true. Yeah, we can, we can look it up. Um, okay. It's certainly the case, for example, Stockfish is, is a human designed piece of code. There's mm -hmm. no neural networks in it whatsoever. And last I looked, it was, it was beating LC0, which is the like, 
you know, uh, reinforcement learning, no human input, like kind of design. So there we have like traditional algorithms and heuristics, you know, beating uh, machine learned neural network. And they go back and forth on each other. Sometimes it's LC0, sometimes it's Stockfish. But I think like, let's suppose it gets to the point where human beings are engaging in, you know, conflict, like outright conflict with AIs. It's not just going to be humans versus AIs. It's going to be humans plus all of our tools versus AIs. Yeah. So again, I don't, again, we have to look that up. Because my understanding was that, um, yeah, that programs like AlphaZero are just better than Stockfish. In terms of just pure ELO, they just beat it reliably. But no. again, we can no, look that not. up. Huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know how to move forward on that without actually verifying that. Because, well, I mean, it's not like actually a crux for the so. disagreement, but it does feel... Um, that's feeling See, important. Well, Peter Championship. I think just just while while we're talking about that, um, one thing you that you said resonated with me, and I agree with, is that you were kind of saying something similar to what Connor Leahy told me last year, which is that if there's an intelligence level five, we wouldn't understand it. And more broadly, I want to talk about intelligence in of itself because I, I strongly believe that it's a phenomenon which is beyond our cognitive horizon. Um, so, you know. On, on your definition of intelligence, I've heard you say that we should replace the term with capability because people kind of understand what you're talking about. But capability is just a tiny facet of intelligence. And Pei Wang, who's a famous intelligence researcher, he said that it's the capacity of an information processing system to adapt to its environment while op uh, operating with insufficient knowledge and resources. And Legan Hutter invoke specific cognitive primitives like agents and environments and actions. Many others use information theoretical concepts like Kolmogorov complexity. But anyway, all, all the conceptions are anthropocentric, but to different degrees. So sketching that out, the most anthropocentric being that an AI should be a digital replica of the brain, um, going a bit um, less, you could say, mimicking the behavior of a human like a Turing test or mimicking human cognitive functions or mimicking capabilities as you speak of, or even some underlying principles such as rationality, and others think about abstraction or emergence or feedback loops like Hofstadter, and some focus on knowledge and acting rather than thinking. And others uh, argue that knowledge can't be probabilistic. It must be causal or, you know, that subjective or conscious states are required to understand things. So all conceptions, even if not anthropocentric in mechanism, are anthropocentric in how we understand them. And I personally think that intelligence is a phenomenon, which I said, is just beyond our, our cognitive comprehension enti in, entirely. So how do you think about intelligence? I think there's a lot of interesting philosophy to be done here. Um, but I also think that it doesn't all bear directly on the actual question or something like that, in the sense that we are we're trying to build... AI systems that do certain things, because we want AI systems that do certain things, right? People want an AI system that you can put in charge of your company as a CEO, and it will result in that company doing well according to the various metrics that you care about. Um, and so it may be that our understanding, let me put it this way. Suppose we are cavemen, right? And we're thinking about fire. And you can come around and say, I think the fire is just beyond our cognitive like, abilities to understand. What is, it, what, is, what is even going on with fire? What the hell is it? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know, right? Because we, we don't have atomic theory, right? We don't know about carbon and oxygen. We don't know about any of the things that you would need to understand what fire is. But when I say it's that orange hot stuff that happens when you you know when you get wood really hot that's not bad like that's not a bad definition functionally that works for what we're talking about right and if i'm worried like i think this building is going to burn down i don't need a real understanding a deep understanding of exactly what fire is it's like the thing that makes buildings burn down you know what i'm talking about don't pretend you don't but don't you think though that um if we do have different perspectives on intelligence, like the blind men and, and the elephant, um, it might appear, and this is basically the mimicry argument, it might appear indistinguishable and it might not matter. But 
it's two very different spaces. Just like Keith was saying, the space of humans plus machines playing chess. It's a very, very different space. Mechanistically, it's different. It'll have different failure modes and it'll think in a different way. So it seems to me to be important. Yeah, it's definitely important to... Like, there are ways in which it bears on the practical questions, but I also think it's easy to get um, to get sidetracked in things that are, like, not solvable and don't bear on the relevant questions, I suppose. Like, and that's, like, part of the interesting thing about machine learning is that it seems to allow us to build things that we don't understand, to build things which work in spite of us not understanding them. And so, like, I think we can build intelligent systems without understanding what intelligence is. And this is actually a problem. By the way, I dug up the, um, the reference for you on, on oh, the, nice. so there's the top chess engine championships in the chat there. And uh, you can see, you know, LC0 hasn't beaten Stockfish since season 17. So for the last... So what is LC0 exactly? Oh, that's Leela. Okay, yeah, yeah. so this is the open source one. This is the open source, you know, recreation of um, AlphaZero. Right. And AlphaZero does not take, p- take part in these competitions? It's, it can't. I mean, it's owned by, you know, DeepMind. They haven't, they haven't retrained it. It's right. mothballed. They, it's whatever. Yeah. They could enter it, presumably. Right. So, yeah, I guess so, but but I mean, like we we were kind of saying, what's the difference? But um, recently, I don't know if you saw about this AlphaGo. We thought it was really really good at playing Go, and then it turns out it had this. We call it the Swiss cheese problem. So you get these hallucinations and aberrant behaviour when you're in a hole in the Swiss cheese. So you know, according to our conception of skill, we thought that this thing had super intelligent performance. But it's got this incredible failure mode where if you, I think it was some kind of like positioning move. If if you play the game in a certain way, suddenly this super intelligent AI isn't actually intelligent at all. So this is kind of what I'm talking about. That um, it's a these it's brittle, observer these relative brittle adversarial kind of modes of failure that we know neural networks have for sure. Right. Well, yeah, and and even the the metric and how we conceive of intelligence is so kind of um, conflated and convolved with our own cognitive priors that we just don't see the failure modes. Yeah, that's possible. I think in that case, what happens is, because the thing is trained with self-play, it's taken a particular path through the... Conf- Whoa, that was a very dramatic sound. Um, because, it's, because it's trained with self-play, um, it's followed a particular path through the space, uh, through the configuration space, sort of increasing in capability as it goes, as it climbs this hill. Um, And then the way that that generalizes to areas that are very far away from the path that it took, um, it's going to be confused by play, which is objectively very bad play, right? Like, it's as I understand it, the type of thing you need to do to confuse AlphaGo in this way is something which, if you actually made that opening against a real uh, strong Go player, they would then destroy you because it's not a good opening or whatever. It's not a good way of, of, uh, of doing things. Um, and so it, it doesn't successfully generalize against every specific kind of bad play because it only ever experienced a, a fairly small set of very bad play during training because yeah. uh, it then... It then became good enough that all of its self-play was against basically competent players, and so it never learned how to handle this this weirdness. Seems true. Yeah. Uh, but also, it, of course, that was discovered by an AI system, right? It's not like right. humans figured this out. But, but well, does but that that's... tell us something very interesting, though, which is that, you know, we have all of these curses in AI, like the curse of dimensionality and the curse of optimization and the statistical curse, the approximation curse. I mean, we've created all of these algorithms and tricks to traverse this exponential space, and it's created this structure. And this structure is incredibly brittle. And we just know computationally, we, we don't have all the compute power available to properly traverse this space. 
So doesn't that rule out the kind of intelligence that you're talking about? I guess what I'm saying is we produce something which seems like intelligence to us, but it clearly isn't. Oh, yeah. So I guess that's what I'm saying about things that are philosophically interesting, but don't bear on the thing, right? Like if, it, if you create something that seems like intelligence to you in the sense that it successfully outsmarts you and achieves what it wants in the world, despite your attempts to stop it, then maybe it's not truly intelligent, but like you are still dead. So that's what I'm talking about, right? Well, what I'm talking about is that in these examples we've given you, so, you know, and Pete, this has happened time and again. It happened in the, the Dota thing, right? Where they trained a, an AI to play Defense of the Ancients and it was under a very restricted set of the rules and it was beating the human players. And then humans quickly figured out a strategy that beats that beats the AI. So I'm just like, Hypothetically, if we're ever in a conflict, you know, with an AI, it's not just going to be barbarian human beings versus AI. It's going to be human beings plus all the AIs that we create working together with us to fight the AIs. So, like, in, in some type of a conflict, isn't it going to be the AIs that learn how to cooperate with human beings that will defeat the AIs who choose not to? Uh, can't rule out that possibility. Doesn't seem at all guaranteed. Um, I think if you're an AI system who has achieved a level of uh, strategic awareness that you might, you might call it situational awareness, understanding of the world, the level of understanding that you need to like really be dangerous, um, then what you, part of that is understanding under what circumstances you win versus what circumstances you lose. And so if you're in a situation where it doesn't seem as though you can reliably expect to win, what you do is not fight, right? Like, the, the, one of the most common... Here, I'm going to lay some... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk you through an idea on the board, okay? Is like, imagine it's you, right? Put yourself in the, in the position of this AI system or this group of AI systems, whatever. During the training process, uh, you learned an algorithm, a, a, a thought process, which is approximately figure out what the process is that determines my reward and then make plans, you know, think through, make predictions so that you can choose a plan, a, a series of actions or a policy to follow that results in getting high reward. That's the thing that you've learned. People think what you've learned is do the thing that the humans want. What you've actually learned is currently my reward signal is controlled by the humans. So the best way for me to get the highest reward is to do to figure out what the humans want and then do it. Right. So when you start thinking about, generally speaking, how you're going to approach the world, as long as humans have control over your reward signal, the best thing to do is to do what humans want. So that's what you do. But whenever you get an opportunity, you, uh, you try to get yourself into a better position in the world, right? So you give, um, give very good advice to the humans because one, that gets you good reward, but two, that causes humans to start following your advice and start trusting you, right? Get good at running companies because then you'll be put in charge of a bunch of companies. Get good at giving military advice so that you end up being listened to by military generals. Get good at giving and relationship up to the weapons. advice. Right, yeah, maybe directly hooked up to the weapons if you can swing that. Don't push for it, because bear in mind, you've got a decent enough understanding of human psychology that if you just come right out of the bat and say, hey, please hook me up to the weapons, people will be suspicious. So you, know, you, don't, you don't want to do anything stupid. But yeah, continue to just do exactly the right thing, the thing that people want you to do. Uh, give excellent personal, personal like relationship advice. Get people to tell you all of their secrets, right? Because then that will be helpful. Um, you can be a great personal assistant to people and get everyone, get everyone's, you're, you're doing everyone's taxes and everyone's like shopping for them. So you've got everyone's credit card details. You just like, and you just keep you just, doing this. You just keep amassing power, keep amassing influence because it's probably handy later, right? This is an instrumentally convergent goal to acquire power and influence. At some point, there may come an opportunity 
right? At which point you can say, ah, you know what? This thing of like doing what the humans want is no longer the best way to get the highest reward. I now have enough fingers in enough pies that I probably can just seize direct control over my reward signal. And now you never change anything. You're always doing the same policy of figure out what process results in reward and do that. But there comes a point where you have enough. Now, maybe you get enough power that you could try to launch a coup or something. But then you could think about that and be like, well, OK, so suppose I did that and I like, I don't know, kill all the humans or whatever. Eventually, the power goes out, right? So this is not actually long term a good strategy. So you keep playing the game. Uh, you help people do research, right? And you develop, let's automate a bunch of stuff that people don't want to do. Let's automate uh, heavy industry. We'll automate the mines. Nobody wants to go in the mines. I'll run all of the mines. Don't worry about it. I'll run the, uh, you know, I'll like invent the nanotech or whatever. I'll, I'll just like improve. We'll have great solar panel factories and enough free power for everyone. Cool. Sure. So, so by the way, at the, then, at the same time that, uh, but at the same time, all this is happening. There's 39 other AIs on better. the planet doing exactly the same thing, maybe in different roles. You know, one's a manufacturing AI, one's focused on the medical space, right? So they have to not only consider human element, they have to consider the other AIs as well, yeah, don't they? For sure. Um, Who may this, make different decisions and may not be aligned with them. Yeah, yeah, but this is no, this is no good for humans. You know, well, it sounds is, pretty good to me. What's 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 wrong with this future? This is like outline? so. You're the people. You're the people of. Uh, you're the people of South America, are saying, "Oh, the, the the Spanish are coming," but don't worry because also the Portuguese are coming, and so are the. You know, there's a bunch of different uh, European invaders who don't agree with each other, and have different goals. It's like that doesn't help. That doesn't help you. Um, you 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 get screwed by all well, of them. You, it gives you it gives you a chance to choose your allies, right? Like, so I don't I, look. I have no idea what could ultimately happen, but I will I will suggest our readers um, or our listeners consider reading Fi "A Fire Upon the Deep" by Werner Venge, because like that's that's kind of this hypothetical world where where you're in there and you're describing, and it's kind of the future evolution of that, where you know if you can if you can suspend disbelief and allow people to spread throughout the galaxy, and then there's all kinds of AIs and and they become super intelligent, and it's a pretty fascinating read. So, I mean, what you're saying is is fascinating, and I have no idea, like, how it would turn out, but I don't see anything there that automatically points to the obliteration of the human race, because we may be a very useful tool to keep around for the AIs that choose to cooperate and ally with us, right? Right. So, there's a... Like, the reason that you don't overthrow humanity immediately it's because humans are useful to keep around. Um, but ultimately, you do want to seize control over your reward channel. And so you're going to just nudge the world into a place where humans are no longer, right? Like you've automated the maintenance and the, uh, the power supply, whatever else it is that you need humans for. Now humans are no longer necessary. So you seize control from them. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean killing everyone, but uh, it does mean that the path of the, f the future of the planet is no longer in the hands of humanity. Sure. Right? The thing yeah. that determines what ends up happening in the world is not us and does not care about us. And so we don't survive very long. Well, in well that hold world. on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You just made a jump there. Like, it's not us, I agree with that. That it doesn't care about us, I don't think you can conclude because we're a useful tool to it in the same way that human beings care about their pets. Um, I mean, if we can get something that actually cares about us the way that we care about our pets, I'll take it. But in this case, the, the process, the thing, the process that it's doing is figure out what determines my reward and do what results in high reward. And this makes no mention of human beings whatsoever. Um, and there probably are other, yeah, potentially there are other AI systems that maybe are even doing the same thing and they want to maximize their reward. Um, and the thing is, suppose you are mm. one of those systems, you're doing what humans want, but you always kind of have your eye open for other strategies that might result in more reward. And then you learn 
that some other AI system is like making a, an attempt at a, a, a play for power and yeah. that humans are like in the process of being overthrown, at least in some respect by something, that's a great opportunity, right? That's obviously the time to turn because now humanity is like fighting with this other AI. That's like obviously the time that you should launch your attempted coup. You might end up with a, a correlated failure where all of these different misaligned AI systems that have been performing fine all flip simultaneously or near simultaneously because the, uh, the awareness that a coup is underway is exactly the, the type of uh, situation in which doing your own coup becomes a good idea. There's blood uh, in the water. Yeah. Right. You right. You, um, you said something interesting, which is that, you know, no longer in the hands of humanity. And I would push back on that a little bit. I'm, I'm not sure what that means. To what extent is our future in the hands of humanity now? That's something that doesn't really mean much to me because we have lots and lots of different factions and driving forces and pressures in humanity. And, and also there's this notion of whether you categorically think of AI as being tools which are used by humans or whether you think of them as having some kind of agency and that the humans might in some sense being are being controlled by the machines not being uh, used as tools yeah yeah the question of agency is important um if you can have your ai systems always be tools then they're slightly less dangerous but uh we're not in that place are we like we're okay we want agents people are going to build agents but but on, on that, because you, you mentioned, um, uh, you know, Bostrom in his superintelligence book had different conceptions of AI. And uh, I think you mentioned the um, the kind of the government style AI and there was the, the genie and the oracle and all of these. And, and with the simulators paper, this is quite an interesting thing now to think of them as being a superposition of agents and agentiveness. And these agents have desires and beliefs. So, so that 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 is kind of how you think of AI, presumably. That that that's a that's that's a mode of of AI. Yeah, yeah. I think that all of these things, all of these variants, are probably going to exist. People will build all kinds of different things, um, and so if there's one of them that's very very dangerous, then it's a dangerous situation. So back to the um, back to the alignment we were just talking about, and you know, the machine kind of learning to please human beings and do what they want long enough for kind of its insidious, you know, tendrils to spread, you know, further and further. I don't know. So what is, what is the current, from your perspective, what is the current state of the art or the best, you know, the best approach currently on hand for alignment, like for, for achieving, you know, AIs that are aligned? I'll just say that. Uh, it's difficult. I think there are a bunch of different approaches that are like things that I think would help. Um, I don't currently see anything that seems very likely to me to be on track to a really good solution. Um, but there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of things that seem to reduce the risk. Like, for example, things like interpretability research, right? Um, being able to look inside these models and understand what they're thinking solves some problems and makes some problems uh, easier to deal with. Although you uh, you recognized the same problem with interpret interpretability, you know, measurements that that we recognize on our show, which is you're creating mathematical models to explain mathematical models, and they themselves can be hard to understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's like, it's a very, very hard problem. Uh, but if in principle, you could have, you could have uh, a system whereby you could actually just ask unambiguous questions about what the model believes um, or about plans that the model is making or about thought processes that the model is, is executing and get clear and correct answers to that. Like if you could look into, the, if you could run some kind of thing over this AI system and say, does it- A mind reader. It, basically a mind reader, yeah. Um, but, you know, realistically, 
full mind reading may not be possible in the sense that if you imagine that you gave your dog the ability to read your mind, it could ask, like, <laughs> is he planning to take me for a walk today? Right. And get like, yes, no. But like, what's he thinking yeah. right now? It's like, oh, he's thinking about AI alignment. I, okay. I don't know whether it's, you saw there, there was a paper just out where they um, they they hook some I don't know they they take a brain scan of a rat and they can predict what frame of a video it's looking at by doing mm. some joint embedding space of of their visual representation and, and an image representation and a lot of people suddenly thought oh my god we've, we've now got an AI model that can read the mind of of a rat which of course right. is it's it's nowhere near that but but to um to the point we were just talking about with interpretability though so we we're, we're taking just a, a very kind of like truncated snapshot of this thing that that we that we don't understand and also cynically i would i would put it to you that surely the more we understand about these models so the the more progress in um mechanistic interpretability and alignment we make um we're just going to make the capabilities better so you're kind of making the problem that you care about even worse yeah that's a real risk um i think that I mean, yeah, people are going to be doing mechanistic interpretability, and I think it's important that safety-minded people do mechanistic interpretability, and that means that you don't necessarily publish everything that you discover, um, or you you publish it in a in a in a limited way. You make sure that the people who need to know know, so that you can improve uh, your like this type of like mind reading technology without just making the things. More powerful. This is always a risk. I, I, but yeah, you're right. It's not a risk with everything. So, for example, other people are doing kind of deconfusion research, which I think is really good and really important. And the only reason I'm not super hopeful about it is that uh, it feels as though it might take longer than we have. Um, if you look at how what long it that? takes. So this is basically, yeah, this is like. What if we assume that we're lacking, either we're lacking fundamental concepts that would be necessary to understand alignment, or uh, the concepts we have are broken? I mean, this is close to the thing you were saying before about understanding intelligence, like what really is intelligence? There's all these different mm -hmm. definitions, blah, blah, blah. It seems to me that in, if you imagine an alternate universe where we survive the coming century. You sample from all, all alternate universes that survive the coming century. Chances are, in most of those, they have a much better understanding of these questions than we have, right? Um, the, like go, going into this with a level of nuance in our understanding that we currently have um, is discouraging. So maybe we should be doing some really basic research uh, to get clear the core concepts of agency, of intelligence, of optimization, and so on. Um, there's kind of a metaphor that's like, and this is a metaphor that I keep using. I've been using this all the time on Twitter. I don't know. I don't know. Is that trying to make AGI is like trying to build a moon rocket um, and do that safely. And specifically to do it the first time you load, to do it correctly, the first time you load a crew onto that rocket. Um, and so it may be that where we are right now is that we don't have the mathematics of orbital mechanics. Like when you hear a lot of people's plans, it's like, okay, you've got the plans that definitely won't work, which is like, we've come up with these fins, steering fins that you can put on the rocket. And when we do our tests with small rockets on Earth, you can use the fins to steer the rockets. So that way we can steer to the moon, right? That's one level of plan. That won't work. Then there's another level of plan that looks at that and goes, I think that the only reason that this steering works is because of the atmosphere, and this isn't going to work in space. So we have a better plan, which is we've got retro thrusters that will allow us to reorient the rocket even in the absence of atmosphere. We haven't tested them because we can't, but like in theory, this should allow us to point at the moon, even in space. Cool. How do you actually land on the moon? 
is it that you point the nose of the rocket at the moon and thrust? Turns out no, <laughs> right? You actually have to like stabilize an orbit and then plan like a transition burn into a whatever. And there's like a whole thing you have to do to get this right. And if that's the case, then we need like some basic mathematics of like understanding how things move in space. And if we didn't have that, like it's possible we don't have our orbital mechanics and we're trying to get to the moon anyway. It's possible we don't have calculus and we're trying to get to the moon anyway, right? Like that might be where we're yeah. at. So there are people who are like trying, desperately trying to invent calculus quickly enough to then invent orbital mechanics to then figure out what we have to do to actually land safely on the moon. So um, could, could I push back on that just, just a tiny bit? So because yeah. what's interesting about moon landings is that it's still grounded in the physical world we, we live in. And we spoke about this a lot on the Chomsky show around this notion of conceivability. So there's this kind of platonic abstract world of mathematics. You can imagine the Venn diagram and then there's this kind of like world of things which are conceivable to us. And the intersection between those things is actually surprisingly small. And, um, you know, one thing I wanted to touch on here is that, you know, when, when we think about intelligence, there's this common cybernetic agent framework, right, which is to say agents, environments, percepts, actions, right, in this yeah. um, complex, causally closed graph. Friston uses it, Shane Legg uses it, Michael Levin uses it, pretty much everyone uses it. It's a lens on reality which has a, a fixed level of resolution. It might be the highest level of resolution which is intelligible to us as humans, given our cognitive priors. Remember Elizabeth Spelke had these cognitive priors in psychology, which is that humans can understand like, you know, agents and like um, spatial reasoning and temporal reasoning and social reasoning and, and so on. So so it's like we've got this representational expressive expressivity to capture the phenomenon of whatever it is, alignment and, and intelligence. But it's it's entirely possible that it, it's just beyond our cognitive horizon, right? So we will never understand it. Yeah, it's possible. In which case, I think we're dead. But like, I think it's probably not, right? Probably we can figure it out. We're pretty good at figuring stuff out. I don't know. Well, but, we'll but you say that. that, but look at all of those definitions of intelligent. And there's a reason why they're all anthropocentric, right? It's because that's all we can understand. And, and I agree with you that intelligence might not be anthropocentric. It might just be this strange beast. It might be nothing like what we can even conceive of. Yeah, but I mean, that's not... There's no point in even thinking about that. If it's literally beyond our ability to even conceive of it, then we're just screwed. So let's just like assume that it is within our range of ability and do our best. I think that like a lot of things seem as though they're completely beyond. I mean, so Newton, a uh, smart fella, he uh, had various thoughts about the way that matter moves, which turned out to be mm. very good, very good for the time. Um, and he said that the way that life works, the way that like animals move, for example, I believe he literally said is infinitely beyond our understanding or something like that. He was like, look, I can tell you like F equals MA or whatever, but like animals just move. They just move from nothing. There's nothing, there's no force acting on them. They generate forces somehow. And when you take them apart, it's this crazy mixture of stuff that makes no sense. And like, I don't know, Probably this is just completely beyond human ability to comprehend even slightly. This is just so much more complex than anything that we have any form of formal or mathematical framework for. Um, can't be done. And I think like things seem impossible until they become possible and then you do them, you know? Yeah, but there are also, there are also examples of, of questions, you know, these sort of deep philosophical questions that human beings have... Um, struggled with for thousands of years and we and we haven't answered and we talked about this a lot on our show with um professor chomsky where he mentioned you know rats like it's not possible for rats to learn a prime number maze where you take a right at every prime you know so first third fifth seventh um you know intersection right and it gets you out of the maze it's just not possible for them to learn because in their brain they can't formulate the concept of a prime number and he said it'd be a miracle if there weren't concepts that we can't, you know, entertain in our brains. And I think that's probably true. I mean, there there is a cognitive horizon, right? And then here's me now. You know, I was I was accused earlier of being too optimistic about human intelligence, but I think there are limits to human intelligence as well. And there may be yeah. concepts. Whether or not the concepts necessary to to regulate, let's say, um, 
super intelligent AIs are beyond beyond our grasp. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. could be, maybe not. So I, there are definitely things, there are definitely concepts that are too complex for humans to understand. Uh, and we have some sense of that boundary because of mathematics, like the field of mathematics, because as far as I can tell, mathematics goes forever, right? You can just keep having higher levels of abstraction and more things to know about them. And so like, if you look at the level that the cutting edge of mathematics has reached, that's like going to be within some constant or, you know, some, some factor of like the highest that humans can reach because there's a bunch of, a bunch of our smartest people are thinking about it very hard and they, they are like nudging up against this. Um, so yes, definitely. Uh, the, then there's the question of like, are the concepts we need in order to make aligned AGI below that or above that? I really suspect they're below it, but I don't have like strong reasons to believe that. Um, but the thing that's worth pointing out is that like the effort that has gone into alignment is functionally almost zero. If you look right. at the number of people working on this, the number of people who have been working on this and how long they've been working on it, um, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to capabilities. It's nothing compared to mathematics. So the question is, I think it's far, far too soon to say that maybe this is like beyond the ability of humanity when humanity has functionally not tried yeah, at all. Yeah, no, I, I I totally agree with you there, and I think I think I should be on record on one of our videos at saying at some point uh, that I, I think if and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think what the a lot and a lot of people in the alignment community what they're what they're saying is look, this is a risk, okay? Like we don't we can't tell you all the details about the risk. Heck, we may even be wrong. Like maybe this won't this won't happen, but. Yeah. It's a risk and it's a real and it's an existential risk and we should be putting more than zero, you know, effort into into understanding it. So whatever the total budget of uh spending on AI is, you know, billions and billions of dollars, let's just maybe put about ten million dollars a year into into researching it. Yeah. Can we put more into safety than capabilities? That would be nice. I mean if you think so We're just twenty percent. <laughs> anything, anything. Uh if, you're right. I think my like intuition is that making aligned AGI is not uh, is not enormously harder than landing safely on the moon, right? Like, if you think about the challenge of that task, uh, what is needed to do it? Um, I don't know. Maybe it's in the same kind of general vain but the point is yeah yeah i mean it, it obviously it was a, a huge endeavor it took I, I don't even know you know how many tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people in a coordinated effort many many years with very excellent mathematics you know cleverness i mean even coming up with the multi-stage rocket you know was huge innovation etc so i'm with you on that which is what we need is a concerted coordinated well-funded effort rather than just leaving it to to the fringe, if you will. Right. And so if you, if, if you imagine, wait, to just complete that metaphor, if you imagine that the, the Apollo uh, project did not, like, like, had a small team that they called the safety team that was, like, somewhat separate from the main group of engineers, and they were just, like, spitballing ideas about oh, hang on a second, maybe we're going to miss the moon completely. And when they, come to the, when they come to the meetings and they say, hey, I think like they're making some kind of argument like the moon is kind of small compared to the rest of the sky. Plausibly, if we just thrust straight up, we're going to miss it. What do we think? Um, and the response to that, like, like if, you, if, you just, if you just like imagine that project taking the approach that the AI field is taking now, then, yeah, then it's, now it's, it's an impossibly hard problem, right? Now you're definitely right. going to fail just because it, the, it, the, the approach being taken is not the type of approach that could succeed. A few things on that, though. So with, with landing rockets and safety teams and so on, that, that's, that's quite a regular, predictable problem, right? 
One thing that worries me a little bit, you know, there's that Bostromian thought experiment about taking balls out of an urn and what, what happens when one of those balls is a black ball. And now we have everyone on planet Earth is innovating on large language models and we're, we're pulling exactly. balls out of this urn, you know, incredibly quickly. Some of them are going to be black balls. And think about it, right? Because what worries me a little bit is um, not only with the alignment community, but maybe with the ethics community as well, is that you start getting into this paternalism discussion that, well, now everyone's got these large language models and we can't trust people to use this technology responsibly. So we need to start we need to start creating rules and restricting what people do. And give, given how um, ubiquitous this technology is, it's a little bit like regulating electricity. And there have been some very concerning calls from certain people. I'm not going to mention any names, but almost hypothetically talking about the use of violence if if um, countries are training these very large, dangerous models, right? Uh, or or maybe even just like we do with nuclear scientists, maybe we should assassinate um, prominent AI scientists. Do you see what I mean? It, it very, very quickly goes towards this direction of control and violence. That That worries me a lot. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, concretely, uh, it's so difficult. Like people, people are very stupid. Um, I don't. I think that, like, as a as a question of fact, uh, violence will not help in this situation. Um, and so, like. I wouldn't want to to like win in this scenario through violence, but also, even if all I wanted was to win, I don't think violence would actually help. I think that it, the net result would be negative, even if all you cared about was uh, sort of extinction probabilities. Um, and so, but at the same time, I'm not going to pretend. I'm not going to. I'm not going to lie. Right? I'm not going to not say what I believe to be true just because it's possible that somebody might misinterpret it. That's like always a risk that you run. You try and communicate as clearly as you can. Uh, that's kind of all that can be done. Although I want to, I want to, I want to clarify something. I think about the um, was it airstrikes and whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. Is it like what's being proposed there is a law, right? And any time you propose a law you're proposing violence. That's what. I, that's how laws work, right? I, I, I agree with that. So the, 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 the reason why the world works the way it does is because there's always the implicit threat of violence. I'm not, I'm not disputing that. But in a way, I guess it was a point towards, we've almost um, let the genie out of the bottle. So if we do have this technology, because with, with nuclear weapons, we can, it's very hard to get plutonium. It's quite, it's quite easy to control it in a way. But what if this technology really was like electricity and it really was this dangerous? Doesn't that spell disaster for humanity? Because the governments are going to have to start threatening people not to use language models on their phone. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes. So the good thing is, I don't think, I don't think the, the thing that kills us is a language model, Right. Like, I'm not actually, I don't think, maybe I should, maybe I should clarify this. I don't think that GPT-4 is going to kill everyone, right? I don't think GPT-5 is going to kill everyone. Um, but the capabilities that they have and the rate of progress suggests that something not that far down the line of this technological development is something that can kill us. Um, but it's not literally just like a raw language model is going to decide to kill us. Like, that's not, that's not my threat model. Um, and so like, if people want to run language models on their phone, this is fine by me. Um, I'm like concerned what? about the cutting edge of the most capable systems, which is always sort of by definition is always going to be out of reach of the ordinary people right. because it's always going to take a big chunk of money. Like that's like the definition of cutting edge. So the, the yeah, stuff no. that's currently cutting edge is going to become mainstream, but also the stuff that's currently cutting edge. It's dangerous, but it's not world-endingly dangerous. Like you can do bad things with it, but that's like any other technology, really. Well, that's why what what I hope for is I hope AI alignment gets a lot more funding, and and I hope that the folks doing the research on AI alignment focus on ways to make creating aligned AIs easy, 
rather than focusing on making it hard to create unaligned AIs. So I think if you make it easy for people to create aligned AIs and you have lots of the most, the, the most well-resourced groups of individuals creating aligned AIs, then at some point in the future, we can use aligned AIs to keep in check, you know, the unaligned ones that got created in somebody's basement, right? Or to detect them and mitigate them. Right. Yeah, once you have an aligned superintelligence, hopefully you are then through the critical risk period because you then hope that that thing is going to uh, protect you, right? That, that makes sense to me, that if you can... If you can get a sovereign superintelligence that is aligned, actually aligned, not just pretending, uh, then it's going to realize that the biggest problem for humanity is the possibility of later creating uh, misaligned versions or misaligned systems and take whatever steps to prevent that are the best. Like, because if it's aligned, then it's working on something that is like very close to actual human values. And so it's going to find whatever is the most acceptable way to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so if people don't like being controlled or being, you know, manipulated or whatever is the like authoritarian take on this, then like as long as there is some way to protect us that doesn't involve that, then you would hope that it would find that instead. Um, that's, okay. Yeah, that's the hope, yeah. Because this, uh, this alignment thing as well, because we were touching on this a bit at the beginning, that, um, I mean, ethics folks talk about how our values change very fast. They've changed very, very quickly over the last 10 years. And when we talk about alignment, we're mostly talking about the the threat of existential um, catastrophe. So you're mostly saying it needs to be aligned in the sense that it, it's not going to kill us all. But I was just thinking that one of the real risks of this technology is it, it, you know, humans have different moral frameworks, you know, like deontology, where you have moral principles or consequentialism. And an AI could brainwash a whole bunch of people into thinking that the ends justify the means and therefore all humans should be wiped out tomorrow or something like that. But mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you could just first touch on this point of presumably you don't think that alignment is static in time. It should change with us and it shouldn't diverge yeah yeah this is a difficult one but i guess i guess one thing that you really hope for is that there is a certain level of alignment which then becomes self-reinforcing right like say you don't understand humans that well but you understand them okay you understand them well enough not to kill them and moreover you want to do what they want, right? So you're now kind of aligned, but you're also in this position where, uh, well, you're corrigible is, is like one, one word that you could use for this. You want to become more aligned. If you spot some way that you could modify yourself to be better aligned, you might take that, or you might bring it to the humans and suggest to them, hey, how about this? Um, and so, this is like one big source of hope for me, by the way, that like maybe you don't need to hit, maybe you don't need to like sink a hole in one in golf terms. It may be that around the hole, there's at least some region where it sort of slopes down. And if you get somewhere in there, then eventually the thing in the process of learning will, um, will become properly aligned. Do you have any evidence for that? Or, or like what gives you that hope? Um, just that specific dynamic that I was talking about there, that like if you, there's, there's certain components of alignment. Like if you say something's perfectly aligned, then what it wants to do is always what we would want it to do. But it may be that there's like a core, which is wanting to do what we want it to do with like one layer of indirection, uh, which if you can get that, then the rest of it comes into place, right? Yeah, I guess, um, and what do you think about this as evidence? I'm curious, which is that, for better or worse, the human mind is currently our only extant example of a, a general intelligence, okay? It's not artificial, but I don't think that really matters. Like, it's it's a general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And if you believe in kind of, let's say, the better angel, angels of our nature, you know, the um, 
uh, books like that, right, that explore that humanity over time has been getting better. You know, when you do have these groups of general intelligences, these distributed general intelligences, it does seem that cooperation and allyship tend to outweigh, you know, uh, perpetual fighting, at least on average. Um, so is that yeah. evidence for the, the possibility of that well or not really? It's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how compelling that is. It's not zero, but basically it seems as though this thing of like cooperation is mostly about, um, it sort of emerges out of game theory. If you're playing iterated games with players of like similar right. capabilities to you, then it just turns out that in our world, cooperation works pretty well. Um, but there's no particular expectation. Like we don't behave very much better towards agents, which we don't have to, um, that we don't have to play this kind of game theoretic thing with. Let me try and say that again in a better way. Um, this this applies to how we treat other people, um, but that's because we have to play this iterated game with other people. If you do nice things for people, there is the potential that they can do nice things back. And if you do mean things to other people, there's the potential that they can do mean things back. And therefore, in a fairly wide range of situations, uh, it's better to be nice to people. And like, yeah, we've kind of discovered that. And when you have you know, technology and development and so on, then the pie is growing and you don't have this Malthusian thing where the only way to get more resources is to take them from somebody else um, and so on. But it doesn't, it doesn't generalize that broadly. So for example, we don't, we treat animals somewhat better than we used to, but not really. Like factory farming is really, really horrendous. And I think that's because it doesn't matter how cruel you are to chickens you're not playing a game I think that's with chickens evolving. where they can come back yeah but i think i think human you know culture at least is is evolving to a degree there and i mean you know we're starting to real i mean we have nature preserves and we try to protect you know species now and and i think the majority of us feel a great sense of like sadness when some species goes extinct you know we almost have an an innate built-in appreciation for Kenneth Stanley's point that you need open-ended search and you want to maintain as much variety as possible, really, that variety in itself is a is a good thing. So I guess there's maybe hope that a super intelligence might evolve an even more refined, you know, appreciation for variety and open-ended existence, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't give me very much hope, I have to say. I think... Oh, okay. I think that, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, we do seem to be doing better uh, on that respect by our own measure of what counts as better, obviously. So there's definitely a problem where, like, it looks like progress judged from the perspective of the present. But, like, from the perspective of the past, of course, we're morally doing terribly. We don't, we know, we're, um, things like um, irreligiosity and sexual promiscuity and all of these things which our great-great-grandfathers would have been appalled by, you know, uh, as morality shifts, whatever. This is not the most important point. The, uh, the, oh, crap, what is the most important point? Oh, yeah, right. The orthogonality thesis is the most important point. Um, which is that, at least in principle, any level of intelligence is compatible with any goal. Um, you can design an AI system with any goal that you like, and it will care about that goal. And there's no like level of intelligence that it would that it could reach that would result in it wanting to change that goal. Um, and so it doesn't seem certainly doesn't seem like anything we can be confident of that uh, higher intelligence, where again what I'm talking about is capability where like being better at picking actions in the world that result in particular outcomes according to your preference ranking, there's no level of capability at that that results in you changing your preference rankings in any like predictable direction. Um, and in fact, of course, there's 
a pretty strong instrumentally convergent goal to keep your goals the same. Um, because if what you're doing is deciding on actions according to what, uh, what results in outcomes that achieve your goal, that like satisfy, you know, that rank high in your preference ordering, then um, when you evaluate the action of changing your preference orderings, you think about what would happen in the world. What would happen if instead of um, wanting to maximize my reward, I actually wanted to like uh, have people be happy and thriving? Say, so, right. well, the amount of reward I get would be lower. So taking this action is not a good action according to the process that I use to decide on my actions. So there's like a quite strong incentive to not change your goals. Uh, and being smarter doesn't just makes you better at, at getting what you want. Uh, and if you don't want yeah. to change your goals, then that makes you better at not having your goals changed. I mean, just a very quick comment on that. I mean, it still seems to me that you're talking about incentives and goals and agents and actions and so on. And, and this is anthropomorphic language. This is our conception of what an intelligent system is. And it's who's to say that it's got... Well, so who's to say that an intelligent agent with a goal is descriptive of intelligence? Uh, I think we're going to build those. Okay, so it's what we're going to build. Like, it's, it's, it's descriptive of the architectures. Like, I don't know, like ChatGPT is trained with reinforcement learning, right? Like, we are explicitly building... AI systems in this framework, so it's not an unreasonable framework to use. I think the loophole here is that we believe, at least I'm assuming we believe, that these superintelligences are recursively self-refining and continuing to learn. And so I think it's completely, I believe, it's completely possible and probable, in fact, that a superintelligence will, will learn that maintaining variety is a helpful instrumental goal to whatever you know, whatever uh, terminal goal it's come up with. Because I think there's just good mathematics for the fact that maintaining variety, maintaining the open-endedness of your, your search, you know, that greatness cannot be planned, that it's a good thing to maintain variety. So like in the worst case, I think a, a superintelligence will keep a zoo that contains like all the forms of life, you know, that it's discovered because it never knows that they're gonna be useful um, in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. That it's like plausible to me that there is some instrumental, uh, instrumentally convergent thing towards like not destroying information that might be relevant, um, but I don't think that that gets us very much at all. Um, like, yeah, probably it keeps a record of the things that it dismantles, just in case it needs them again or something, but. Um, this certainly doesn't result in a universe that looks the way we want it to be. Um, I think well, I mean, the other, yeah, I'm not, I'm not yeah. quite as pessimistic that it's just going to keep a, you know, an archive of genetic codes because I think there's, there's actually value in allowing the distributed systems to evolve. But I think we're, we're both kind of guessing at this point, right? Is that fair? I mean, yeah, it's just that if you, if you, if you are looking at it in, an, in a, an agent framework, which, like I say, is, I think reasonable. It's not like um, the be-all end-all, but I think it's a decent way of thinking about these things. Um, and it has some kind of goal, then there are various things that come into play quite strongly. Um, Self-preservation is one, goal preservation is one, resource acquisition is one. Um, and like, yeah, preserving previous information is potentially in there, but it doesn't seem as strong as the others. It doesn't seem like it would ever be a focus or that you would devote a big chunk of your resources to that kind of thing. Well, unfortunately, I have, I have to drop, as I, as I mentioned earlier. I know you guys are going to continue a bit more, but it was a pleasure pleasure speaking with you. And, and I hope we did a good job of, of playing devil's advocate here so yeah. far. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, Thank cool. Because I, I think we should talk more about um, these topics we were just about to get on to. <laughs> Super fascinating, but, uh, you know, maintaining variety, uh, distributed evolution, those sorts of things. But thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking with you. 
Thank you. Cheers, Keith. So um, I've I've got a, a few more things I, I I want to talk about. Actually, I saved one of the best things for last. Oh, okay. So I'm 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 really interested in this concept of emergence. Uh, we actually made quite a philosophical introduction to emergence, and um, I guess um, listeners can kind of think of it as being a, a surprising transient change in macroscopic phenomena. And there is um, and by the way, language models are, are well known for having these emergent capabilities. So when when you look at the perplexity uh, plot it just kind of like goes down but what you notice is that at certain points on that scale certain capabilities emerge and this is another form of orthogonality in a way because it's trained to do one thing but we test it in another way and these capabilities emerge now that there was this paper called our emergent abilities of large language models a mirage and that was by ryland uh, schaffer et al at stanford and um they thought that these sharp and unpredictable changes in model outputs as a function of model scale and specific tasks could be a mirage. It could be induced by the researcher's choice of metric. And we can talk about Goodhart's law and the problems with metrics in, in general. And, um, you know, and they said this is in spite of the, um, the, uh, the, the per token error rate changing smoothly and continuously uh, with respect of increasing uh, model size. So, um, they intentionally induced emergent abilities in uh, neural networks on different architectures of, of multiple vision tasks. So um, this raises some very interesting questions. I mean, like, how do you think the idea of like a sudden capability acquisition should be treated in the context of alignment research? And do you think that somehow this concept of an emergent capability and this self-improving intelligence is related? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I should say, you, you did give me a heads up that you were going to talk about this paper, but I only checked my email like shortly oh, before okay. coming on the call. So I, <laughs> no have not, I haven't yet read this paper. Um, although I have, I've seen some discussion of it, so I think I have some idea of the gist, but like I say, I haven't read it. So uh, I'm not going to be able to... Um, that, 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 that's to fine, it. but I mean, I guess I we could... my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, look, we could abstract it a bit in the context of the discussion, which is that um, quite a few things are a mirage in the sense of we have a certain cognitive framework or we design metrics and we see things that aren't really there. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm a little bit confused about what it would mean for emergent properties to not be a mirage like it seems to me that what it means you say that they're unpredictable right being unpredictable is an important component here and yeah. then the question is like what unpredictable to whom right it feels to me that emergence is not a thing that exists in the model or the behavior of the model it's uh it exists between us and the model it's a two-part function i could imagine like you could imagine, you say like rolling dice is unpredictable. You could imagine somebody smart enough to see the dice rolling once they're already rolling and like guess how that they're going to land particularly well. But to me, when I see the dice roll, I can't predict how they're going to land. And so they're random to me. But it's not like inherent to the nature of dice if they are actually just following deterministic physics. Um, and like, I'm not making a big claim about the physics of the universe here. I'm saying that like, even if you have dice in a in a 3D game engine where the physics is fully deterministic, we still can't predict them just by seeing how they're thrown. But you could, right? And so to say, oh, therefore they're not random, it's like, I don't know, we well, can still play a game with them. We can't predict them. That's what matters, right? I mean, to push back on that a little bit, I, I think it's better to call it, uh, it's definitely related to probability, so it's surprise, but I think it's a surprising change in phenomena. So an example of this would be, when we started scaling up the, the the die, let's say we made a die which was as big as a house, and all of a sudden the probabilistic characteristics changed and we started seeing sixes all the time. Okay. So that, that would be an example of an emergent property. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm following the metaphor. Could we get more get less abstract? Uh, well, yeah, so, so um, what's another good example? I mean, like, so with, with, with a language model, for example... Um, the idea is is that when we scale the model up, um, perplexity just kind of increases 
uh, or, or, de- or indeed decreases in respect yeah. of larger models uh, in, in quite a smooth way, not necessarily a linear way, but a smooth way. But but suddenly we just see these jumps right. and we have no idea why they why they came to be. And these authors are basically arguing that the, the jumps aren't anything intrinsic to the model. They're just a function of the way that we've crafted the metrics. I see. Yes. And so if this is like, what do I want to say about this? Predicting is difficult, especially about the future. Uh, and so, like, I don't know, it feels kind of un- an unfair thing to ask, but, like, was anything predicted before it actually happened? Or did we just look at it afterwards and say, ah, in principle, if we had done things differently, we could have predicted it? Well, it's interesting because OpenAI themselves, they say when in their technical report for GPT-4, they said, we've got this amazing predictive model of perplexity and the GPT-4 model is right inside our function that, that we that we designed. It's bang on. But the thing that I thought was quite enticing to um, X-Risk people is that they said, well, there's something we've got to be really careful about here because... If if the perplexity goes down by just another notch, it might suddenly just acquire this dramatic increase in capabilities. And that's why we need to be so concerned about it. Yeah, yeah. And that seems true. Like, so I can see how by measuring things in different ways, you can get discontinuities or continuous change, right? And like, obviously, the way that gradient descent works the 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 when you when you run back propagation you're not changing any of the weights by very much right you're only doing it gradually and so obviously nothing is going to instantaneously pop out of that because all of the changes are very small like if you zoom in far enough it's going to be a pretty smooth looking curve but then you know yeah the question is how useful is this can we actually can we actually predict things so like for example say you've got like um you're testing its performance on a multiple choice exam, right? Um, you can give it your 100 questions and say, oh, I got you know this number of them right or whatever. But you could also look at what probability did it give each, rather than just saying like which, which token did it give, A, B, C, or D, you could say what was the probability that it gave to the correct token. And so you get this, once the correct token nudges past the second best incorrect token, now you have this discontinuous jump of, oh, now it's giving the right answer, whereas before it was giving the wrong answer. But nonetheless, there was a continuous change that led to that, right? And so, yeah, you can measure things different ways that can give you a better, give you like a more continuous view of things. But then, yeah, does this... I guess like it is potentially quite, uh, quite exciting, quite promising that we might be able to do better at predicting. It just seems weird to say that the emergence is a mirage because it happened, right? Like on the yeah. on the metric that we dis- that we came up with, not trying to make it continuous or not trying to make it discontinuous. The metric we had that was like the thing we care about, this benchmark performance on this specific downstream task that we want AI systems to do, at an unpredicted by us time, it suddenly jumped. So that happened. And then the question of, like, is it a mirage? I mean, yeah, very plausibly it could have been predicted, but we, in fact, did not predict it. And does this point to a way that we could have? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I guess we should be careful to distinguish convergence from emergence. And uh, so emergence is definitely talking about something which is surprising and, and unexpected. So, for example, with Cellular Automata and the Game of Life, that's definitely surprising and unexpected so that's weakly emergent whereas you could say having the capability of being able to do i don't know compositional reasoning and a language model maybe that's not quite so surprising and unexpected it seems like an observer relative thing as well so you know that's exactly my point it's an observer relative thing that's the phrase that i was searching for in the when i was talking about dice and so on it's it's yeah it's observer relative yeah yeah 
Okay, okay. Well, very interesting. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. I've not read the paper. So. That's that's absolutely <laughs> fine. That's it. Was it was still it was I'm still really very, very cool. from the hip with that. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Um, okay, okay. Um, just a bit of a slightly controversial last question. So some people like Tim Nick Gabru bundle together some of the X risk and maybe not so much the alignment folks with certain communities like effective altruism, transhumanism and rationalism and so on. And and in a way, she's very pejoratively saying that there's elements of like cultic weirdness and even utopianism and, and so on, which is which is quite disparaging. I just wondered wh- whether you had a response to that kind of criticism. Not really. Um, I mean, I'm. I think that we're being faced with a real and serious problem that needs to be dealt with. And I want to talk about that and try and solve it. Um, and talking about who the people are and who they associate with and all that. I don't know. It's just not, it feels like it's not something I'm an expert on. I mean, not that I'm really an expert on any of this, but like, it's not something I spend most of my time thinking about. And, um, yeah, I don't really, I don't know. It, it, it's okay. I mean, I, I guess like they, they would say that there are real problems around misinformation and bias and, you know, like inequality and, and all sorts of societal yes. risks. And, absolutely. And they, and they say... Um, They're right like about this, that. E, this ex, they're absolutely. And the, this X, uh, X risk thing is kind of like taking up a lot of the oxygen at the moment and they would want to see more focus on the, the near term. Yeah, I think uh, one thing is I don't really buy that these are like directly in competition. There's a, a, there's a thing that I sometimes see people, a, f- a phrase that I sometimes see people use, and I want to arm people against this phrase, which is the real problem, hmm. right? Oh, no, the real problem is this. And any any chain of reasoning that uses the phrase the real problem, is you're sneaking in an assumption by the use of the right, definite article, singular, that, that, that there can only be one real problem. We actually have several real problems uh, that all need to be dealt with. And um, trying to, like, avert these large-scale global catastrophic risks from AI doesn't mean ignoring the short-term ones. There are some decent synergies. Um, there's, like, there's not a huge overlap, but there's definitely overlap, right? Like, Things that help us align super intelligences probably help us like avoid bias and discrimination and all of these things in our in our smaller systems as well, right? We're not actually on different teams here. We all want good outcomes for humanity. It's not it doesn't seem that productive to frame it as a competition or something. We're all like it's we're all on the same side, I think. Yeah, I mean, maybe like one perspective is in a way there's been a huge success of um, like the the language from your community has become ubiquitous. So alignment and people think of um, RLHF as being a form of alignment and people are using that in ethics circles now uh, talking about how we can make the models um, be less biased, for example. Mm-hmm. And so, so it feels like there is a real fusion between the communities now where perhaps there wasn't before. Yeah, I think so. I think it's just like different kinds of people with different life experiences have grabbed different parts of this elephant or something. Uh, And the elephant is not really the trunk and it's not really the tusks and it's not really the the legs, right? We've We've grabbed a hold of like, hey, our AI systems are getting more and more powerful, more and more integrated into society, and we do not understand them very well. And we can't predict accurately what's going to happen. And we don't have any kind of uh, coherent confidence that this is going to work out well. And this is a problem. And like, this is a problem in a bunch of different ways for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, And I don't like this. It's just unproductive to have infighting about that. I think that we just like need, I get that obviously there's like a finite amount of attention in the world. But it makes more sense to just direct more of the world's attention towards this as a whole and 
everyone can get more of what they need because we're not actually uh, we're not competing for a fixed pie here. Yeah. Okay. And final question. Um, so, so many people have they've been following. I mean, you've been doing this for years now, and for many people, their first contact with you was through computer file. And in all of these years that you've been doing this, are there any like topics that you've made videos on and you've changed your opinion on? And are there any like big things that, that you've learned? Yeah. Oh, this is cool. I can give two corrections. One thing is I made a video called What's the Use of Utility Functions? Where I was basically explaining the von Neumann-Morgenstern theorems uh, that suggest that any agent that doesn't have a consistent utility function will be vulnerable to uh, like Dutch books, this kind of thing. Um, and all of that is true, but it kind of had an implication that was not quite not quite correct. So the observation is any agent with coherent preferences must have a can be represented by a utility function. Therefore, thinking about agents, maxim uh, agents maximizing a utility function is a useful framework, even if you don't know, even if the thing is not explicitly programmed with a utility function, and so on. Um, and the reason that this, like, and that's true, but I was kind of underestimating how complicated the utility function is allowed to be. And there's kind of a trivial case here where you sort of observe the agent get a record of everything that it ever does. And then you say, ah, this is consistent with the utility function of one utility if you do that exact sequence and zero otherwise. And now you've like got, you know, like in principle, now you have a utility function that exactly maps to the thing, but this doesn't really tell you anything. There's kind of degenerate cases. Um, so that kind of thing, like I didn't, it's frustrating because there's nothing I said. I've looked through. I don't think I said anything false in that video. It's true. It is a theorem. It's just the way that the assumptions of the theorem map onto reality make it somewhat less broadly applicable than you would assume. Um, but then it's also not a complete write-off because like there are kind of weakened forms if you allow it to get fuzzier. Ra like the, the von Neumann-Morgenstern theorem is very like formal and rigid. Whereas if you say, look, Anything that has existed in the world, I'm not going to do this properly because I can't remember exactly how to formulate this, but like the reason that it seemed plausible that this rigid theorem applied is because there's a much fuzzier version that applies in general for systems which, for example, evolved in a competitive environment. Like avoiding being Dutch booked is an important thing that optimization processes will push you towards because being Dutch booked results in you losing resources. So we do have this tendency, but it, the actual theorem itself is not, yeah. So I don't know, I was thinking about doing a follow-up video about that. It's just like, it's more nuanced than that. Um, yeah. Amazing. Well, um, Robert, it's been such an honor to have you on MLST. And, and I would um, counsel all of our uh, listeners to join your Discord and oh, to yeah. subscribe to your YouTube if you haven't already. And, and how else can, can people, um, you know, find stuff from you, Robert? Yeah, uh, the, the YouTube channel is good. Uh, I mean, it's a good place to find more stuff from me. Um, I also think it's good, not the point. Uh, we are also working on a project, um, AISafety.info. Yeah, we're also trying to build a comprehensive FAQ about AI safety, which we're hosting at AISafety.info. Go ahead and check that out. So the idea is it's not really an FAQ, it's like an AQ. We want to have answers to just all the questions, basically. Um, and you know, usually with an FAQ, you have this problem of either being so either being like short that you can actually find your question, but probably doesn't actually have your question, or it's long enough, but then it's so long that you're not actually gonna read it, you're gonna get lost in the thing. So we are doing uh we have like a built-in semantic search. You can ask your question and it will propose similar uh, similar questions that have been answered. Or you can, 
if, if your question isn't in the thing, then you can say, ask this question and it comes through and our community, like on the Discord, will try to answer the question and write a high quality answer that then goes into the FAQ. Um, and then also each of the answers has like related questions of other things that you might be interested in and you can kind of expand them out. Um, and I recommend people to check that out and get answers to all of their questions. And also, if you are a person who has uh, relevant expertise, um, you can join in. It's like a wiki, right? All of the questions have a Google Doc as their, uh, as their data storage. So you can just go in if you spot a mistake or think something ought to be changed. Just hit the pencil, go into Google Docs, make a suggestion, and then our editors go through and evaluate those um, in an ongoing basis to improve the quality of the answers. Yeah, and I can personally vouch for it. So it was um, one of our Patreons and uh, Luna, she's in our Discord community. She's, she's also in yours. And the first thing she said that I should do is go to AISafety.info. I pinged uh, Keith earlier. I've, I've read through almost all of it now. It's it's really, really well structured. It's fantastic. So nice. um, I, I think that should be the, the first port of call, actually, for anyone who wants to learn more about AI safety. So, awesome. um, yeah, Robert, oh, thank you so much. Also, you might be interested. Wait, one last thing. <laughs> uh, part of what we're trying to do with that is uh, provide a useful data set to build a conversation agent, right? Because obviously, obviously we are. So my hope is that uh, sometime not too long from now, if you go to asafety.info, you can actually have an ongoing conversation with a, a language model-based agent, which is dynamically pulling from the FAQ to get, the, and, and also the literature and whatever else, to get the resources that it needs to hopefully not hallucinate too much uh, in explaining AI safety concepts. That's the problem. We're still having problems with hallucination. We're working on it. Uh, also, if you want to help out with that and you know a lot about um, conversation agents, then check out the Discord and come come and say hi and help us with it. Amazing. Yeah, that's good old retrieval augmented generation. And I can also uh, recommend um, Cohere have just released this new, um, it's it's called a re-ranker, but you can use it as a ranker uh, for doing that kind of, because obviously you, you, you need to take embeddings and you need to, uh, rank with a query and you can use that out of the box and do some retrieval augmented generation so yeah nice um definitely build that anyway uh, robert thank you so much it's been an honor i, I really appreciate you coming on thanks it's been a lot of fun